Hi, this is Roger Green, executive producer and host of the Surfing the Mesh Tsunami podcast. This weekend, we are bringing you six conversations from episode six, our Friday conversation with global KOLs about the impact of the ResDifra approval on Thursday. This might be the shortest summary I've ever put on an episode that we're doing in real time as compared to the vault. After stimulating and fast-moving conversation, I ran out of things to ask. So I asked the panelists what else each wanted to say. Seven engaged panelists make 11 different closing points, each valid, each interesting. Enjoy. The approval of a first drug indicated for MASH may be the most significant achievement in fatty liver disease in longer than anyone can remember, certainly since some of the major diagnostic decisions and assessments were made. The conversation is interesting, and our global leaders have a variety of perspectives, so sit back, listen, enjoy, learn, and when you're done, join the conversation in our LinkedIn discussion group. I just got one question for everybody. Anything we haven't talked about today that's come through your mind in the last couple of days as we've been, as, as the drug's gotten approved? Anything at all? Louise Campbell. I'm just going to chip in on something that was discussed yesterday. Women are the leading cause of transplant for ma- uh, muzzled and mash. And it was highlighted in the session. We did, when we're looking at who to start to find the disease in, we need to start to stop this. We need to treat women as a high-risk postmenopausal women. We need to stop them getting and driving this transplant list. We don't get transplanted as frequently and we don't do as well. So we really have to look at that. And the ethnicity issue of looking for ethnicities who progress to cirrhosis and through cirrhosis at double the speed of Caucasian. So we need to be picking up populations for me, that are at higher risk within the populations that we're going to be treating, which goes back to what Jean was um, saying at the beginning. Excellent. Thanks, Louise. Zobar Younasi. Other, other thoughts? I'll, I'll say a couple of things to close my thoughts, is that this is the, the first step and a journey. We can address certain aspects of the disease with a drug, even with lifestyle, but the epidemic, the pandemic, global pandemic of this disease is not going to go away unless we actually sort of pair this up with national policies, global policies at WHO, making sure it's part of non-communicable diseases. We have, we educate our, 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 uh, you know, payers, our politicians and everyone else to sort of not only make the drug that is effective and safe available, but also help us with food insecurities, with other issues that promote this disease, ultimately. I think I'm very enthusiastic about this drug, partly because of this and what Yohan and Laurent and Yen and Jeff and everyone else have been saying is that it is also sort of getting in more enthusiasm and energy in an area that's been sort of deflated for the past year or two. So I'm hoping that those things will happen. If those do not happen, then I'm, I'm afraid we're going to just make a small dent and will not feel it as a society. And ultimately, most patients will not be, you know, benefit from drugs like this. Jeff McIntyre. To tie the couple of last comments together, Roger, if I may, I think one of the things that I got a lot of excitement out of, aside of the specific announcement uh, from the FDA, Omagical, was seeing kind of all the buzz that's happened over the past week to 10 days leading up to this with other companies. I mean, we're seeing that Inventiva has now resumed their trial. There was a little hiccup there that they've gotten sorted out. Out. I'm seeing tons of announcements of people that are eager to kind of get into this zeitgeist in order to make sure that they, you know, get a little bit of their piece of the pie. We're seeing announcements on positive results in phase one and two A trials that are coming out on social uh, a lot more so. And so I'm I'm seeing kind of the the rising tide lifting all boats in this. And I think that that points to something kind of specific in this, which is that people are excited not just because magical got a across the line at the FDA, but they're seeing that there has been more than just finger pointing, if you will, as I referred to earlier with the FDA needs to do this or primary care needs to do that. But there's actually been more concentrated liver health advocacy over the past couple of years that really came about from previous lessons learned, if you will. When you look at what happened with Magical versus uh, prior incarnations, the distinction is really, I mean, aside of their clinical results, but it's that safety profile that is something that really stands out along with the non-invasive stuff as well. But it's that safety profile 
well. And if we go back earlier on, you know, GLI held a FDA requested, but held a FDA externally led patient focused drug development meeting. When you go back and look at that transcript, everything that they talk about is non-invasives and safety, non-invasives and safety and that. And so for us, you know, from our patient advocacy standpoint, what we see is that the, the market has been de-risked for liver health investment through effective liver health advocacy writ large on this. And I think that's the positive that we're coming out from this. Great comment, Jeff. Thanks. Laurent, Ian, Jorn, anything to add? Go ahead. Laurent Castera. One last short comment. So uh, being working for 20 years in NIT, today for me it's a special day because I think uh, shifting to NIT has been a small step for us and FDA, but a giant leap for patients. Thank you, uh, Astronaut uh, Castera, that's uh, well analogized. Uh, Ian Yorn? Ian Rowe. Yeah, I've got, I've got one comment, and I don't want to be at all negative around today, but I think it's really important that the integrity of the trial is maintained until its actual conclusion. The licensing yesterday was conditional, and with all of the excitement, patients who are enrolled in the trial, where although it's blinded, it may be clear to investigators and perhaps even patients that when the ALT hasn't fallen, that maybe they're not on the active drug. You know, those patients have to be encouraged and supported to stay within the trial. Otherwise, we will never find out what the true efficacy of this drug and perhaps many others in the future really is or are. Excellent point. Jorn? Jorn Schattenberg. Yeah, one more to say. I think uh, this was a fascinating discussion on a, on a topic that really moved us because uh, after a long journey, uh, we've come to a point where there is an approved drug that's safe and we have uh, figured out diagnostics, how to implement them and use the drug. Very excited to see and learn from the U.S. colleagues. Um, it'll be a little bit more time, but my understanding is that the EMA region will see uh, resmeterone, uh, hopefully maybe early next year. In that time, there's going to be a lot of learning and uh, education needed. The work the Bear is doing with the Global Mesh Council, reaching out, uh, educating people, and I'm very, uh, very excited to, to be here. Okay. So first of all, thanks to all of you. I have two closing thoughts. First of all, when folks talk about systems theory and they don't really want to get into any details, they give the example of a butterfly flapped its wings in Tokyo and three days later, there's a rainstorm in Chicago. Uh, this was the butterfly. And my point is that we are frequently way too confident about the linear paths that things are going to take. This can veer off in so many different directions that I think it's appropriate for all of us to act with integrity and caution going forward. And caution in terms of lack of hubris and not being certain that you're right, because who knows, right? That's number one. Number two, I wasn't going to say this, but Zober brought me back to it. Um, when we started this podcast, Stephen Harrison described his mission as putting big fat debt in fatty liver disease. And, uh, I say to our colleague, Stephen, that if yesterday wasn't putting a dent in liver disease, we've got to make it as big a dent as possible as Aubert. I think you got that one right. But if yesterday wasn't a signal day for putting a dent in liver disease, I don't know what is. And he and Madrigal and the other researchers are all to be commended because, boy, um, four years ago, nobody I knew thought this was going to get there. And here we are. And now back to Roger. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. If you have any questions or comments about the content of this conversation or the entire episode, please put them in the review section of the page from which you downloaded this conversation or send an email to questions at surfingmash.com. We'll be back Wednesday night with a group of patient advocates discussing their excitement, reaction, and next steps after the approval of Resdifra. Until then, stay safe, surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.